Rest of the World, my one podcast, one. my weekly record of the time, and chance to talk to people in the Saskatoon and related areas of my life uh, that form the community around me. And today is no exception. I have a special guest here uh, that is here to help me provide an alternative to the RIA, the IPI, Disney Plus, and Gordley here in Saskatchewan, Anonymous Educator. Are you still there? Yeah, still here. All right. So as kind of suggested by the moniker, you are a real teacher. You actually mm-hmm. have education in and you know what you're doing in front of a classroom. Unlike me, who practically just pretends to know what he's doing in front of children as I teach them things, you actually do know what you're doing. But do you want to maybe give a little bit of clue to our listeners, not necessarily who you are, but a little bit about your background so that we can have a little bit of context? Okay. So I'm an educator in one of the divisions here in Saskatoon, and my background is music education. So I'm not in a traditional K-8 or 9 to 12 classroom situation. My situation is I More teach complex. band. Yeah. <laughs> so. it's, I, I teach band. So it means that I am an itinerant, and I teach the 6 to 8. So I'm the person who suffers through the first year of squeaks and squonks and hot cross buns and twinkle twinkle little star. All right. So it's, it was interesting that we were actually just talking about hot cross Buns, because that actually brings us to my first question, which is, what type of music do you listen to? So that's a pretty, I won't say loaded question for me. It's, I try not to stay in one particular lane, but sometimes I do get on moderately obsessive music tangents. So right now, I'm listening to an awful lot Balkan beats, or I'm going to call it kind of Balkan Eastern European punk, but it is colloquially known as gypsy punk. But again, with the kind of enlightening we've been having about slurs and terminology, which more and more the word gypsy to... for much of Europe certainly is that kind of a slur or seen as that kind of word. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're wanting to investigate the kind of music I've been listening to, if you do put gypsy punk into the Google search, you're going to come up with Google Bordello and even here locally in Canada, you might come up with Lemon Bucket Orchestra and groups like that. I've been listening to a lot of Chantel, which is S-H-A-N-T-E-L. He's out of Germany, I think, actually, but he's really, really known for his Bukovina club years, where he did a lot of remixing of Balkan groups, Balkan brass bands, and things like that. So I've been on that did I hear Balkan brass band? Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> You totally did. Um, you this this is a sound like if you want like pump me up. I am in a good mood. Let's go out and like party and burn the neighborhood down. <laughs> if you want that kind of music, you have got to check out a Balkan Brass Band. That sounds really cool, and I will definitely be checking oh, that yeah. after the show. But so the yeah. reason why I asked that question though, because we were talking about this a little bit before the show, is that mm-hmm. it seems that there's. I mean, you had a very very specific answer that you had can you've probably been asked this question before but you know right well that other people ask this question especially in like we we were talking a little bit about the dating context where yeah uh, the the average person when they are asked this question here in saskatchewan what do you think the difference is between your answer and their answer and let's start with that okay so i think to anyone that was is kind of wondering the question is when you ask somebody hey so-and-so what kind of music do you listen to? And you you can get very specific answers like mine, and you you know, people will go right into their like super niche favorite tangent of music, which is cool, because that's how you learn about other styles of music. But usually you get this canned answer. Well, I really like all kinds of music, except country and rap, which is where you start talking about a little bit of classism and elitism in music, because what you're saying when you say, well, I'll listen to all of it, except country or rap, is I don't want to listen to what rednecks listen to, and I don't want to listen to what black people listen to. And I I have such a hard time not processing that answer, but I'm like, I'm, I'm just, I get physically exasperated when I hear it, and people see my shoulders sink. And they're just like, oh, like that isn't a good enough answer for you. And I'm like, because you're not allowing yourself to experience the breadth of, like you're completely writing off a genre because you think it is one 
thing. You're not allowing yourself to experience the breadth of it. You may not like twang, whiny country, but I mean, I will defy you if you tell me that Dolly Parton and Pat Klein don't slap. And, and Hank Williams and Johnny Cash. And even, now this is where I have to admit I'm not as up and up with modern country, but I do have a former colleague that I was in university with who is now writing in Nashville. Which I'm, I'm just going to pause there. Like For those yeah. who are kind of out of the loop on how the music world works here in North America, there is this city of Nashville, which is basically a musical city. Like the, mm -hmm. the whole of, whether or not you appreciate the business side or not, there are so many talented musicians and so oh, many yeah. people who are just like crazily involved with music in a deep level in their life and they just mm -hmm. gravitate towards Nashville and a significant mm -hmm. portion of that is in country music. And I've had it described to me as if you think you are ready to be a professional musician and to cut it in the music industry, especially as a guitarist, mm -hmm. start walk or driving or walking in the direction of Nashville. And then like yeah. when you start getting close, go to a gas station and then like have like a little a musical duel with the person at the gas station working at minimum wage on the outskirts of town. And if you're better than him, then keep going. Otherwise, yeah. you, know, you basically hit your match and that's where you're at at your career. Yeah. Right. The the legit way of building up that cred is you pick, or if you're picking country music as your forte, you do your best to get known locally. You do your best to make connections here within Canada, within the scene. Here in Canada, the country music scene is predominantly Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. But I mean, there's a, some pretty good stuff coming out of the Maritimes too. And you just start making connections and you start feeding your tapes or your demo MP3s or whatever. You start feeding it up the pipeline and if you get somebody like if you get somebody connected to especially the singer songwriter scene in Nashville saying like yeah dude you got the chops you should come down here like don't stop like don't stop don't don't pause like just go straight to the airport book your airplane ticket get down to Nashville right. like leave everything behind and just tell people to ship it to you in an Atlas truck because the next <laughs> person who is trying to get into the musical world will not stop and if you hesitate yeah. at that point you have missed your chance and you only get yeah. like so many chances to get into so many that chances world. and thanks to this colleague of mine who is making it as a songwriter in nashville i am gradually being exposed to not what's on top 40 country radio but everything that's starting to come up through nashville people who you don't really don't know their name right now but i'm proof positive you're gonna know like everyone who listens to country music is gonna know their name in five or six years right and it's good stuff it's good it's not schlocky it's not like if you think country music is toby keith brooks and dunn big and rich and yeah and all those like that tight eh, no it's broad and they're just like there are little subgenres of pop music there are little subgenres of country and there's a home for everybody there right and so you were mentioning a little bit before about that there is this class issue involved and I kind of find it interesting that we went dovetail right away into the how to get into the music world involving your personal connections with the other human beings who make up the world of music, which of course is a really contentious thing when we start talking about class and especially yeah. when we start talking about race. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that will keep you from being a successful musician, maybe not so much anymore, but I mean, you're deeper into the, the world of music than I am, you may be able to know. But like, if the thing that makes you successful or not is whether or not you have the right people in your life, and you have the mm -hmm. wrong skin color or ethnic background, and the people in your life are maybe not like opposed to you being in their life, but there is this tendency to reward people who are similar to us, whoever we mm -hmm. happen to be. And the people in the world of music, whether we're talking about country music, rap music, and classical music, there mm -hmm. does seem to be a racial component, right? Yeah. And so basically we're like, if I, I was reading a, a little bit before about the, I think it was the, it wasn't the symphony, but it was like one of the arts scenes in, one of the other arts in Saskatoon here, commenting that virtually everyone involved was white. There was no indigenous or very, very limited indigenous engagement. And the demographics here in Saskatoon are changing. And so yeah. you know, there's basically a question being raised of like, this situation exists, what are we going to do about it? And mm -hmm. I think that this is a situation that does exist, especially in things like the, the world of classical music, where mm -hmm. there, there really is a disconnect between the ethnic background and skin color, etc., of people who are involved in producing classical music 
versus mm -hmm. something like rap, for example. There is a difference. Oh, yeah, there's a huge difference. Now, um, uh, that, that, um, the arts group that you were, I'm assuming you're referring to the Persephone Theater. Yeah, I think it was a Persephone. And, uh, yeah, it was Persephone Theater where the shakedown eventually culminated in the resignation of their artistic director, who, after much consultation and meetings, there was, things happened at Persephone that needed to happen. And I'm not part of the theater world, so, like, I'm adjacent to it through my connections in musical theater. But, uh, yeah, it's a thing that just kind of needed to happen. And, and I'm like, kind of interpreting this right, that there's this, like, storm that is already kind of over the the Persephone theater world, but the music world is like on the edge of getting it sort of thing. Yes. It's with COVID having thrown pretty much every theater performer, professional musician, especially orchestral, but even, like, this isn't even a problem that has touched orchestral musicians. This is touching even your big act pop. Like Lady Gaga can't tour. Jonas Brothers can't reunite and do anything. Spice Girls are talking about a tour in 2021, if and when they can get a handle on COVID. Like, this is something that has broadly impacted every person who bases their income on performing to the public and they've all been thrown on some form of unemployment now obviously lady gaga is going to be doing a hell of a lot better than any sso musician but it's still a thing that has impacted and it has brought quite a few issues in performing arts that have been simmering underneath the surface it's been bringing them to a head and one of those especially in musical theater and classical music is accessibility to the art form there was a new york times article that has stirred the pot and it was talking about how should orchestras end blind audition in order to promote a more diverse orchestra. Now, what is a blind audition in this context? <clears throat> okay, typically in the orchestral scene, a blind audition is you perform your audition. So to get into an orchestra, you got to prove that you got the goods, and that's your audition. And every in an orchestra, every instrument has its set. Like there's pieces and, and little set excerpts from symphonies that are like, if you don't know this, you don't have any right to be here. So you got to know those, and then you usually have to perform Okay, when, when you say sets that they have to know, so these are like specific, perhaps common songs that you have to know, like let's say yes. the clarinet part. And if you don't have okay. the clarinet part to this song already memorized without even being told that you're going to be tested on it, that you don't get the SSO job sort of thing? Well, you are told though. You're told which excerpts you play. You don't have to memorize them. You are allowed to have the sheet music in front of you. Okay. But you should be able to play those symphonic excerpts at an expert level. So, so this um, isn't the sort of thing where like most even professional musicians will just be able to like sit down and throw the book they've never seen in front of them, open on that one page and then like start playing from the sheet music. You probably have to practice this at least once in your life. Oh, have heard the song, you, maybe. No, you, the idea is that you should know, if you're going to make, if you're thinking that you want to be an orchestral musician, like you're going to do this as your job, then like you should be able to play those orchestral excerpts at a level of, I could perform this in a concert with patrons having paid X number of dollars to hear me play, then I should be able to play it beautifully. Hmm. Like that's the kind of level of preparedness you want for the audition. And then, so you play these orchestral excerpts and then you have to play, there's usually one or two standard pieces for your instrument that are like the godly pieces. In the clarinet, it's Brahms Concerto 1, Brahms Concerto 2, or the Mozart Concerto. And if you are thinking of being a clarinetist and you've never heard of or seen those three pieces, go back to the beginning and start again. Hmm. Uh, I did the Mozart in university, as an example. So you go to a blind audition, and what it is is that you have all of this stuff prepared. There's a panel. It usually is the other members of the section that you are auditioning for, the personnel manager of the symphony and the personnel manager is actually the only one who gets to see you and know who you are so it's, and, so it's basically uh, like a, a double blind experiment yeah. of some kind yeah your skill is being yeah. tested on this repertoire and repertoire alone yeah. they don't see you they don't even see your feet like you are behind a screen and all they do is hear you and the idea of the blind audition came about because of systemic gender equality issues in european symphonies hmm. 
like women who were auditioning and playing like out playing the field were not getting the job because they were women. Well, and, and I'm not actually going to pause there. I don't know how deep into this you want to go, but I know for a fact that in your experience that the le- the playing field of getting to be a highly, highly trained musician at this kind of classical level mm-hmm. has not been particularly even for you, personally, because oh, no. of your gender. No. Oh, gender and class. So, and that circles back to the whole thing about the New York Times article. So, the, to sum up briefly, you show up, you do the blind audition, they don't know who you are until the panel says, yes, we like number six. And the personnel manager comes in, because the personnel manager is the only person who knows who number six is. Right. They come in to the meeting room where you're all gathered, and they'll say, number six is, and then number six will raise their hand, and they'll be like, congratulations, we're going to take you on as a member, trial member of the Symphony, blah, blah, blah. What the New York Times article was talking about, though, is that what the blind audition should do is it should be symphonies composed of meritocracy. The person who plays the best gets the spot so that every spot in your orchestra should be filled by the exact person who needs to be there, regardless of race, gender, gender identity, sexuality, whatever. Like, if you got the goods, you deserve to be there. What the New York Times article was talking about, though, is that, well, maybe we're not. Like, maybe we're, maybe we should take the person who is, black indigenous person of color and and put them in the, to, to create more racially diverse and, and gender diverse symphonies and where it's creating a lot of backlash in the community is we don't first off we don't see how getting rid of blind auditions really kind of make it doesn't ensure like i'm not like this is going to sound weird, but I think hopefully your listeners will understand. If the white person is better at it, shouldn't that person get the job? Like, if they just played better, like, shouldn't that be the thing? But, like, and that's what the blind audition is for. Like, he or she who, or they who play best gets the spot. But the New York Times article, it's like, it's one of those things where, you know, you could put underneath it in the comments section that gif with the purse, the stick person figure and the point going right over their head. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened in this New York Times article. Like, they got so close to the point and then didn't dig into it. And the point is, you can't get to that level of performance if you don't have access to everything that gets you to that level of performance. You can't audition for a symphony if you didn't have the ability to study a music degree. You can't study a music degree just by having grade six to 12 band behind you. You're not going to survive. You need to have at least a certain comprehension of music theory and a certain comprehension on your instrument. And nine times out of 10, they want, even if you're not studying piano at university, they want you to have at least a bare minimum proficiency on it. So now you're talking about taking music theory tutoring and you're talking about taking private lessons on your instrument of choice. And you're talking about taking piano lessons to have that as your supplementary instrument. And you're talking about joining groups because you can't practice you can't perform this in a bubble so you're now talking about being part so can you are you able to access the youth orchestra in your community or chamber orchestras in your community like are you able to have all of these pieces in place in order for you to study music at a university level in order to go on and audition for a symphony orchestra and the problem is that at that very first level, at that music education level, it is freaking cost prohibitive. Like, I mean, we're talking, I mean, people talk about the kind of money they throw at kids in order for them to try and make the NHL. People who are committed, like the path of trying to be a musician, you're throwing equal amounts of money at the study of music in order to get to the level that puts you in a symphony orchestra, which is where I do have an incredible gripe about the way professional athletes are paid versus the way professional musicians are paid. Right. Because it's the same amount, it's the same amount of expenditure, it's the same amount of hard work, it's the same amount of dedication. So in my personal instance, there was a lot of sacrifice that my family made in order to 
even get me close enough to consider music education as a path, let alone performance. Performance was never going to be a thing. So is performance like and, a particularly, it's like the, the NHL, closer to the NHL rather than other aspects yeah. of it? Okay. Like trying to, getting to be a soloist on the stage at Carnegie Hall, I would say is actually even harder than trying to make the NHL. And that dream will only be made possible if there is a butt ton of money to be thrown at it in the process. Hmm. Like there were times where, like here's, okay, here's a prime example. An opportunity was afforded me midway through high school and a choice had to be made. I could either get the professional instrument I needed in order to continue on with the journey because at a certain point, the $650 plastic instrument, which is great for school and serviceable for school band, is not going to cut it moving forward. The choice that I could make at the time was I could get the instrument and or instruments because I actually needed two of them. I could get what I needed to continue moving forward or I could get a procedure to fix the thing that I'd been bullied over since I was a little kid. Right. And I, like, I mean, honestly, I don't know how many, you tell that to some people and they'll be like, well, that's a hell of a decision that a 14, 15 year old kid has to make. Like, how dare you put that decision on them? But because of the class inequality, that is a decision I had to make. Do I take this route and get the thing, get the procedure done that fixes the things that I'm bullied over? Or do I take the money and just keep ignoring the bullying, you know, 10 years of it at this point, and just single-mindedly drive into the, the things that I want? And I ended up taking the, I mean, it wasn't, it really wasn't much of a decision for me. Like, at this point, I'd have endured 10 years of shit and abuse. So I took the instruments and ran. Right. But that only happened because of a particular kind of windfall that happened in our family that afforded my family the ability to do that. Otherwise, I honestly don't know if I would have been able to pursue uh, even a music education degree because you get to, as you progress, the wall keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was fortunate in that everything that I wanted to do, my family found a way for it to happen. But you see and that, like, that's, there is this wall there, and there is this, like, and, go ahead. And the wall gets bigger. Like, if this is not a case of, if I leap over this wall, the rest of the race should be easy, easier. Like, no, 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 no. You leap over the first wall, and the next one, the next wall you hit is going to be even bigger, and it's going to be bigger again, and bigger again, and bigger again. And... The, if you come from any sort of class inequality, getting over that wall just gets harder and harder and harder. And you have to be, and that's where you really do have to have the talent and the drive. You have to have the talent so that the people who doubt that you can do it listen to you and go, oh, well, no, okay, they they really should be here. And you have to have the drive to say, F it to every obstacle in your way and figure out crafty, shifty, wily ways to get around it. So, so on that side, though, like, you're referring to that uh, the New York Times article on how they were, like, missing that, like, the other layers where this selection yeah. is happening. And so, yeah. from your perspective, I mean, maybe the this particular selection point is not the only one that needs attention or whatever, but is that, mm -hmm. what, what would make this better? What would help what would, how would someone even, well, other than just knowing about these w different walls, what would be the one step in the direction of doing something about it? Number one, funding arts education <laughs> <laughs> and pro properly funding arts education. And, and I, I'm even um, going to pause there and be like, actually having education probably would be a start, <laughs> you know? Uh, right. You know, properly, properly funding arts education, properly funding initiatives to level out the playing field. I think of this. Canadian Tire has a fantastic program called, I think it's called Jumpstart, where you can get, kids can get funding to have equal access to sports, which is great. Absolutely fan freaking fantastic. And, and like, not even sports. just like on the side of making it a little bit more level for people to get into the NHL or something like that. But like sports are actually just good for kids. Like, it's good yeah. to not have nothing to do other than sit around and play video games. 
sports are exactly. useful for just health, keeping healthy. Right? For kids. And the Jump Start program has programs available within it that if that kid has, and even the Tim Bits Hockey has, like, if that kid, Sidney Crosby is a product of Tim Bits Hockey. If you find that kid that you're like, holy crap, they can play, they have access to so many of these programs that are able to kind of level out the cost of the playing field. Because, like, I mean, hockey in particular is a ridiculously expensive sport, especially when you want to try and get up into the elite levels. What I'm asking, though, is where, and I mean, if, and if anybody has the answer to this, listening to the podcast has the answer to this, by all means, answer my question for me. Where is that for the arts? What big multinational corporation is leveling the playing field for musical theater and leveling the playing field for drama and leveling the playing field for music and for visual art? Like, where is it? Right now in Saskatchewan, we have a charity called Creative Kids, which is trying to level the playing field, but they get their money primarily from donations and SAS lotteries. And they have had instances where they've gone out to the public saying, we're, we've got more applicants than we have money to give. We, and that's the broken heart in it. I mean, that's why Creative Kids or El Sistema in Saskatoon, which is a string program in core neighborhoods. Okay. This is why, like, every time on Facebook, everyone's like, oh, we'll have a birthday fundraiser. I'm always like, okay, cool. Give money to Creative Kids and give money to El Sistema. Like, please, donate. Like, if you want to see more black kids, more indigenous kids, more kids from lower income homes succeeding in the arts, please, please donate to Creative Kids because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to level out the playing field. They're trying to offset the cost of private lessons. They're trying, because I mean, I don't know what private lessons are going for nowadays, but my mom paid $1,000 a year for my clarinet lessons and $750 a year for my piano lessons. Right. And they'll offset the cost. But like, why should this be a thing? Like, why should we have to try and fundraise for this within the community? Why is the, why are our government not saying, why are taxpayers not rising up and saying, if the kid can play, whether they're from Pleasant Hill or Arendelle, should they not have the equal opportunity to pursue that as far as they can? But right now, the kid from Arendelle is going to get a better shot at pursuing it simply because they come from a socioeconomic background that piano lessons, theory, all of that stuff, not a problem. But the kid in Pleasant Hill is dependent on maybe the Heart of the City piano program, which gives them a half-hour piano lesson every two weeks. Which, I mean, it's a start. Like, a half an hour is better than nothing. But if you actually want to get into piano, never mind getting good at it, never mind, like, all the things you can do with it, but actually just, like, emotionally engaging with a piano, occasionally yeah. you need a little bit more than that. You need to be able to yeah. sit down and just play for a couple hours. That's, that's part of and becoming a great piano player. And part of the issue is that in lower socioeconomic, in lower income homes, what are the chances of them having a piano in that house for them to play? Or even a keyboard. Right. And so then there's just that aspect of accessibility added either. And that's what the New York Times article completely, completely missed. The lower instance of BIPOC people in classical music is not just a cultural thing, it's an economic education thing. And if you want to see more diverse orchestras in the future, we have to do more to put money into the arts education system. Mm -hmm. And so uh, another thing I'm going to like draw into this too is that like we were talking a little bit before about some of the parties that maybe ne well neither of us went to in high school and how like <laughs> when at least in my experience I was invited a couple of times when I was playing with a band that I was in in high school uh, to smoke some pot and to do some drugs with them and I was like no I don't have time like, I, I, I really don't have time for this. I have to go back home. I got things to practice. You know, I, I'm studying for something. Like, there's this sense of urgency that I had, in part because I had the piano in my life, and I had a piano at home. And I was practicing sometimes two, three, even more hours a day, right? Like, it was something that was there that I was driven to be engaged with that wasn't drugs. Yeah. 
And there's a lot of kids right now, and we've talked to, or I've talked to a couple of people on this show even, who have been talking about how the gangs in the city are attracting these younger and younger kids who have nothing going on in their life. And they're giving them something. They're giving them this high. They're giving them some social reward and social engagement that if you're... And family. Yeah, and family, for sure. But like, family, yeah. If you have the the instrument in your life that is demanding attention, you Mm -hmm. will not fall for that. You will have something else to balance out, to not get hooked, even if you do yes. engage in the drugs. So, Well, I mean, like one of the things we spoke about was in, when I reflect back on my grade 12 year, you know, I have two questions. Number one, did I really just let that whole year fly past me because I was so focused on one inevitable goal, which was my audition for university? And number two, with everything that I was doing to make myself look good to the university, how did I not lose my mind? And your answer to that was really quite simple, which was the drive. I didn't lose my, trying to, I had all of these goals and expectations, but they weren't external, they were internal. Like I had no one in my family forcing me to do any of this. This was all my own goals and my own expectations that I demanded of myself. And that's one of the things, having that, having the hockey or the soccer or the music or the musical theater or the art, like having that one singular purpose that is an internal driver. In in education, we call it the intrinsic reward, Mm -hmm. which is what we're always trying to strive to get with our students. We want them to be intrinsically motivated, not extrinsically motivated. So so basically, Um, I think the, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the idea here is that like you have so many hours in front of the students as a teacher, and you can say a lot of things and put a lot of things on the blackboard and put a lot of paper in front of their nose, and they're going to soak some of that up, and some of it they're going to have a little bit of trouble with whatever, but if you can get them to want to learn something or a class of things, that's like... You got it. You you won, right? You won the game. Like, if you get a kid so jazzed on math that they just just want to soak it all up, like, you don't... Really, all you are is just the facilitator of paper at that point. You are the facilitator of books, and you are the... And that's that's where, like, we really want to try, and that was one of, like, the big key things when I was studying education at, at the university was the teacher as facilitator, not the teacher as lecturer you must do you must have this in your head you cannot move on to the next grade if you do not have this knowledge Hmm. like we are ideally we would love to see ourselves as just facilitators of learning and that's that's the goal you're constantly trying to achieve is to try and get the student jazzed about something so that they continually want to be lifelong learning whether it's broadly or in a particular subject or whatever it is. And then you can drag the other subjects along by kind of hooking them to the thing that the student has as their intrinsic motivation. So for myself, it was because I knew what my end goal, what I wanted my end goal to be, and because I was always kind of internally driven to be the best that I could be at the thing that I was doing, I had an understanding that being quote unquote smart, but at least being reasonably intelligent and competent in my marks in school would only further help me to do the thing that I wanted to do. So, I mean, that's why I was constantly shooting for the 90 averages and everything, because there's, there was absolutely no way that having a 93 in history was going to look bad. Okay. So now we're, were you in the advanced program in the... Uh, yeah, so when you say 90%, that means a little star on it because you were in this special program that the yeah. classes were a little bit more difficult. Like, not like impossibly yeah. difficult, but no. if, if you're just pulling a random high schooler from North America somewhere and saying, yeah, you got a 90%, compared to your particular 90, your particular 90 actually is a little bit more meaningful on that and would have taken just that much more work to achieve, right? Yeah. So, and I mean, some of the issues that I had in high school really stemmed from, like, I did not start in the advanced program in grade nine because I did not start at that high school in grade nine. I started halfway through grade 10. I had gone to a different high school. And I left that different high school for a multitude of reasons, not the least of which was the bullying had escalated into physical violence. And I was not getting support from staff and 
some administrators in the way that a kid being that bullied should. So it was just kind of a, and at that point, I was, the friends that I did have all went to that particular high school and they and they were like, yeah, well, you should just come over here. And meetings were set up, things were arranged and I was able to transfer. But because it was halfway through the year, they wanted to see my performance in regular stream before they considered it letting me into the advanced placement stream. So I really had to kick out the gun in the last half of grade 10 because I needed all of my grade 10 teachers to sign off on the letter saying that you should be in the advanced program. Right. So, so which was not, a, like, at the end of the year, ended up actually not, like, I was so super worried about it, but it was like a freaking non-issue. <laughs> So, in the meanwhile, though, we were talking a little bit earlier, uh, actually, I think we started on the idea of yeah. this hot cross buns and this yeah. kind of shared musical culture that the approach to teaching music in basically the way it's taught everywhere is to begin with these simple songs and get the children to learn these simple songs. But the specific mm -hmm. simple songs that are picked, uh, you were mm -hmm. talking a little bit about that. So, what, why, oh. why hot cross buns and not something else? Well, and that's actually a conversation music educators are having right now, broadly. We picked these songs out of the kind of British colonial North American shared experience. Because the songs that we use to teach kids how to identify notes and the songs that we're using in the method books to teach beginner band students how to play their instruments are not the same songs that they would use in Europe. And they're not definitely not the same songs that they would use in Asia. But I mean, they are the songs you would use if you are a descendant for better or for worse, of the British colonial experience. So, but, and these were songs that would have been sung to you as a little kid. And these are songs that you would have heard throughout your youth. But what I'm noticing is that these, and, and I'm not the only one noticing this, other music educators are noticing this. Kids know Hot Cross Bun simply because, I mean, we, I mean, as early as eight years old, we subject it to you on the recorder. But you come across things like Yankee Doodle Dandy, uh, Erie Canal Capers, Waltzing Matilda, some of these other more simple songs that you tell your class, well, give them a you know how to sing these songs. They're kind of in our collective consciousness. And more and more, students are looking at you with that really familiar blank stare, like, uh, hey, lady, I've never heard this song before. Right. And it's not like and these, you're, you're, these people have no access to music. I mean, it's not right. quite that bad yet, where, like, there are people no, who have no, no music in their life. There is music in their life. It's just not that, right? It's just not that. So all of a sudden, you're like, well, what are some of the things that have been in the collective consciousness? Like, here's a prime example. You want to teach students about the fancy word is modulation. The generic word is key signature change, where you play a song and it starts on one series of notes, and then halfway through the song, it shifts into a different series of notes. There are lots of cultural, Europe white Western European cultural songs that could teach you of that mod, take, teach kids the modulation shift, but those songs are no longer being listened to at home. They're kind of escaping the cultural consciousness. But for better or for worse, one song that has not, that's actually just entered the collective consciousness is Baby Shark. And the stupidity, the glorious simpleness of Baby Shark is that it teaches modulation because baby, mom, and dad are in one key. Grandma and grandpa are in a different key. So as you're going like, Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark. You do that. And it's three notes. That's all it is. It's three notes. In a so this is something pattern. for sure. You can play on a recorder. Oh, you can play it on a recorder. You can play it like you can play it on every single like I mean every instrument. I don't even have to teach. I don't even have to write the notes out. All I have to do is put the note names up on the board. I like D E F whatever. Like I just have to put the note names up on the board and tell the students. That's Baby Shark. Play those notes to the rhythm of Baby Shark. And like you could even do like one better, where like you could put the notes on the board in the timing and like get the kids to play it. And even if they don't know the song, after about twelve notes, they're gonna be like, "Oh, I know how this goes." Right? Exactly. Exactly. Like it is. It, it, it is those. It's that deceptively simple earworm. And then because it modulates halfway through the song, you can teach the kids about key signature changes and then therefore teaching the kids different different patterns of notes. 
I mean, I had one who does not know piano, did not know how to play an instrument prior to entering my band room. And after having introduced Baby Shark to the class, two weeks later, this kid comes up to me and he's able to play the Baby Shark sequence with modulation. Like, you could just give him a note. Didn't matter. And he'll, like, figure it out, me. figure out the modulation and from he it. Had, and he, he already knew the modulation. It's like, play this in F sharp and boom, he yeah. does it. You know? Yeah, play it, play it on this note, and he could, and he could do it, which is transposition, yeah. which is a, like a higher level concept skill. So you're just like, wow, okay. So then, Baby Shark is an example. So, now we aren't so bad yet that the kids don't know hot cross bun. They know hot cross bun. We aren't so bad that we've lost that one yet. But here's another one that I've seen come up in discussion groups on Facebook amongst okay. music educators. We've got to stop maybe using these songs that we think are in the collective cultural consciousness, and we've got to start just pop song because that is now the new collective cultural reference right or like, at least something like that was popular fairly recently like maybe yeah. not like the top 50 this week but no something the kids may have heard once in their life right <laughs> yeah exactly so, so here, here's a good one not a lot of kids in my band who don't know who queen like the rock group queen is or was depending on your frame of reference hmm. you put down, I do have actually, here's a problem, here's a, a, a micro problem that only music educators will bitch about. Getting a good arrangement of a pop tune for a band to play is gold. Getting a good arrangement of a pop tune for a beginner level, like grade six to eight band to play is even harder. That is the rare, rare diamond. Yeah. And I do have one of another one bites the dust. If I put that down in front of kids, they'll practice it. They'll sit in my band room five minutes after band and practice it. They'll be banging on the door at recess to come in and practice. Not, like, not just because it's minus 40 and they don't want to go outside. Like, it'll be pleasantly beautiful weather outside. They're and they'll be intrinsically motivated to They're practice that song. They're intrinsically motivated because they recognize, because it. They recognize yeah. it. Because they know it. Because they can invite their friends into the band room and as they're playing, duh, duh, duh. Another one bites the dust. Like the kids, the other kids who aren't in band are singing along and snapping along. Right. Like it's a it's a thing. So we maybe so the conversation we're having is that maybe we need to start shifting towards pulling simple tunes from the the zeit the popular zeitgeist and incorporating them into our band. So instead of making my kids learn how to play waltzing Matilda, maybe I give them. Do you know off by hand who does Havana? Havana. With the name of the sing yeah, the singer who does Havana, um, Camilo. Camilo. I have no, I have no this idea. Is, this is, yeah. Okay. <laughs> But, um, I mean, yeah, like, right now I can just, I, I can hear the voices of my 200 students going, Oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> just, they, they all know it. But it's really simple, like, Like, it's five notes. Yeah. And it's, it's catchy and it's a hook and they know it. So why are we not teaching that? Why am I not teaching my baseline players how to do Down on the Corner by Clear Crease uh, Clearwater Clear yeah. Revival? Because, I mean, we're at the point now where that's their grandparents. Our parents are these kids' grandparents. So when they go to grandma and grandpa's house, they're not listening to, like, super old-timey music, <laughs> like, or what we would call old-timey music. Like, grandma and grandpa are listening to the Beatles, and yeah. grandma and grandpa are listening to CCR and Queen and Kiss and the Rolling Stones. Right. And so why are we not why are we not using that? Like, so, uh, like why am I not? I am going to pause there because we are starting to get yeah. near the end of the show here. Uh, so okay. I, I think I do have an answer to that question. But again, I will get I will get into that in another show, maybe with you in it. But the okay. uh, for the last little bit here, is there anything you'd like to get across to the province, to the world? Now that you've got their attention, one last thing. Fund arts education. Fund arts education. Fund it. Fully fund it. Don't allow your governments to slash arts education. Don't allow them to put it on the bookshelf. Don't allow them to use COVID-19 as an excuse to put it on the shelf. Generally speaking, just make sure your education is funded. Get out there and start. Make, make education an election issue, especially this year in Saskatchewan. We are voting provincially and civically. Get, like, don't just sit there and be like, oh, I'm going to vote for this, that, and the other because they're super strong on these things. Like, look at all of it and see where they stand. Ask the hard questions about class size. Ask 
the hard questions about classroom composition. That was a big one, big one with us this year. And we were, I honestly don't know if we, I feel like we got some of that message out to people, but we were just leaving others behind in the dust. Like, it's not just about controlling who is in the classroom. It's about making sure that everyone has the proper supports and the proper access to the education that we as educators can impart to your children. But if I don't have the support to help the kid who's going to be bouncing off the walls, then I'm not teaching. I'm crowd control, and the other 25 in the room are not going to learn. Classroom science and composition and education and arts education, just look at education and make sure that doesn't fall through the cracks. That's a good point to end on there. So we, good good point there, especially, again, that the election is coming up. So now is yeah. the time to start investigating and doing your own research and make this a priority because 20 years down the line, we're going to rue if we didn't. So exactly. with that in mind, I will end the show. So if you did enjoy this show, please keep in mind, uh, there is subscribestar.com slash Jeff Dash Cliff which that will encourage me to keep making this show. Uh, but other than that, I will cut off here, and uh, I think in post we'll add in a, a song that's a little bit long, but hopefully you enjoy. So I will see you all next week. <laughs>